torpedoes, full speed ahead. It's become a rallying cry at Navy sporting events, but do you know where it originated? Today on A History of the Navy in 100 Objects, we learn about the Civil War battle that produced the phrase from Admiral David Farragut. We are joined by Charles Swift, the managing director at the museum, for a look at a collection of artifacts from the Battle of Mobile Bay, the steering wheel from the USS Hartford, as well as two sets of hand-drawn battle orders from Admiral Farragut himself. I'm Charles Swift, managing director of the United States Naval Academy Museum, and today we're talking about the USS Hartford, David Farragut, and the Battle of Mobile Bay. I'm standing in front of the wheel from the Hartford, uh, which came to the Naval Academy in the early 1900s. Mobile Bay was the last remaining Confederate port on the Gulf of Mexico and was of strategic importance because most of the Confederate commerce with the Caribbean was directed through Mobile. After the capture of the Port of New Orleans a year or two earlier, Mobile became the attention spot for the United States Navy. David Farragut was ordered to take Mobile Bay. He finds himself off of Mobile Bay on July 17, 1864. The first document that you'll see shows Farragut planning an order of battle for an eventual attack. Farragut does not know when the attack will take place. He's waiting on four ironclad monitors to join his fleet. So the document we're looking at shows the 14 ships that he knows he has available to him. The document shows first an arrowhead pattern with the Hartford in the lead, which is traditional. The flagship of the Admiral is going to be the one first into battle. The second so it shows a line formation, also designed to go through what were treacherous conditions into Mobile Bay. Mobile Bay was guarded by three Confederate forts, but because it was also a working port for the Confederacy, it had to have an open channel for ships to sail through. The Confederates tried to solve this problem by laying what they called torpedoes, we would call them mines today, along one side of the channel. That left an open channel for friendly ships to pass through, but it would also force anyone desiring to enter Mobile Bay as an attacker to pass under the guns of the forts that would be, and the ships would be easily in range of the forts guns. Farragut knows that the mines are there, he knows where the forts are, and in fact, he also knows the Admiral who is in commanding the CSS Tennessee, which is the ironclad that has primary responsibility for guarding Mobile Bay. The Admiral in charge of the CSS Tennessee is Franklin Buchanan. Franklin Buchanan was the first superintendent of the United States Naval Academy and had a long and storied career as a Union Naval officer. He fought in the War of 1812, distinguished himself during the Mexican-American War, and also commanded a ship on Perry's visit to Japan in 1853. As a Marylander, he resigns his commission and ultimately joins the Confederate Navy. Farragut had also had a long career, starting in the War of 1812. Between the two men, they had a combined total of over 100 years of naval service between them. They knew each other well, they knew what to expect. And Farragut knew that it would not be easy entering Mobile Bay. By early August, Farragut is joined by the four ironclads that he had been expecting since the middle of July. And what I'm holding here in my hand is the order of battle that Farragut ultimately decides upon. It's different than the first document because what we see are four ironclads that are going to lead the way into Mobile Bay to draw fire from the Confederate forts. We also see that the Hartford, Farragut's flagship, is no longer at the lead. Farragut's been convinced to put himself second in the order of battle in order, in case his ship is sunk, in case he is killed, in order to keep continuity, the Brooklyn is sent in front of the Hartford to draw the early fire. The Brooklyn is also outfitted with what Farragut would call a cow catcher, which was designed to sweep up mines in case they were encountered uh, during the attack. On August 5th, 1864, the conditions are favorable for the Union fleet to enter into Mobile Bay. The Confederate fleet is four ships led by the Tennessee, Buchanan's flagship, 
and three small gunboats. The ultimate total for the Union fleet is 18 ships. Farragut has decided to use his line pattern that we saw in the earlier document. However, he has had another ship tied to the Brooklyn in order to draw fire in the hopes that it would absorb fire from the forts and then leave the Brooklyn free to fight the Tennessee when it came across the Tennessee. The Brooklyn has four forward-facing guns on it. The Hartford only has two, so it is more suited to approaching the Tennessee and attacking it. The first thing that happens, the ironclads go through the, th go through the open channel. The captain of the Tecumseh sees the Tennessee and veers off through the minefield against orders to try to directly engage the Tennessee. The, t the Tecumseh hits a mine and is sunk with most lives lost, including the captain. The Brooklyn, in the lead, becomes confused during the heat of the battle and ultimately stops because of conflicting orders about the positioning of the ships. Upon seeing the Brooklyn stop, Farragut becomes very concerned. The plan is to move quickly through the channel and out underneath the guns of the forts. And it is at this time that people have said that Farragut pulls the Hartford to go around the Brooklyn through the minefield that the Tecumseh had just gone through and said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Ultimately, the rest of the fleet makes it past the minefield and into the bay, where it makes quick work of the three Confederate gunboats and the Tennessee. The battle is over three hours after the first shots are fired. We hope you can join us at the museum soon to check out this exhibit for yourself. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast.